Voice of San Diego podcasts are made possible in part by Border Angels. Border Angels is out with a new podcast called Bad Hombre. Every Monday at noon, listen to a new episode with Border Angels founder Enrique Morones and guests. They'll be discussing border issues, immigration policy, hope for change, and more. Look for the Bad Hombre Border Angels podcast on Apple Podcasts or online at www.borderangels.org. Welcome to the Voice of San Diego podcast, where we make sense of local politics, schools, housing, public safety, the civic issues that impact the life of a San Diego resident. We break it down so you can understand it and make educated decisions. Everything that goes into our investigative reporting, the journalists, public records requests, the data crunching, and this very show depends on the support of people like you because we're a nonprofit news organization. Enjoy the show. Welcome to those of you listening on News Radio 600 Kogo. This is the voice of San Diego on podcast. And I'm here. My name is Scott Lewis. I'm here with my friend Andrew Keats. What's up, buddy? And my other friend, Sarah Libby. Hello. We are the Trace Amigos. And uh, I got a just I just got a problem. I am I, I really feel like there are too many penises in the news <laughs> these days. There's a lot. There's, I just I hit my limit when there was that story about the Navy pilot that did the the big phallus symbol in the sky. I'm like, this is it. That's there's too many. I mean, that was actually like a refreshing break from the other stories. Relative to all the, the other penis stories. stories. <laughs> yeah. That one was comparably harmless. So, okay, I guess we're good on on I, I guess I just didn't realize the gauntlet of penises that women had to get through to be successes every day in career all the time life yeah sorry yeah thank you hey <laughs> i'm acknowledging that appreciate it i don't you know i don't have to speak for my species but it's not a good time uh we also had the unfortunate experience of an old friend bob filner Coming into the news, my gosh, this man fled in disgrace from the city after being the mayor, first Democratic mayor in 20 years, didn't even finish a year on the job. He did prime us for for what would come later. I we we were, I think, more prepared for for the the moment we're living through now than our friends in the rest of the country based yeah. on our experience in 2013. I think so. And it's actually was really shocking to see uh, this story emerge in the news this week, only because, like, why now? Yeah. I mean, we know why now, because there's this wave of, um, you know, these stories and people feeling more compelled to talk about them. Yeah. But, like, this was three years ago, and it was so clear that it was a pattern at the time that I'm 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 frankly surprised that we haven't heard of one thousand more stories about Bob Filner's time in D.C. Yeah. So this week, a congresswoman from Colorado said that she was sexually harassed by Bob Filner. Yeah, Representative mm-hmm. Diana Deget. She said she's a Democrat. She said I was in an elevator. And then Congressman Bob Filner tried to pin me to the door of the elevator and kiss me, and I pushed him away. I mean, I was his colleague. He couldn't take action against me. And believe you me, I never got into an elevator with him again. So a few things. One, that is almost note for note like every other accusation made against that guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, just almost identical. Yeah, this the weird, like, the weird mall you know, the mauling kiss. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're all just such consistent patterns. Mm-hmm. It's really unbelievable. And I feel like we were prepared. We've been prepared because of the Filner scandal for this rush of news post Harvey Weinstein. Like we're uh we're prepared for the the weird response that well, comes for, from the Yeah, accused. for instance, Roy Moore's first uh yeah. apology denial. I was I, I was in practice, so I was able to identify that he didn't actually deny the allegations yes. against him in, in in large part. Exactly, he he left ample room for there to to for for him to still be guilty of something while apologizing and denying something else, uh, which you know uh, the people who are going through this for the first time might not be might not realize how to look for that sort of thing. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that was what was cr- always crazy to me about the Bob Filner scandal is he never actually said, it, even if you just went off what he acknowledged he did, was enough for him to resign. That's this is the fight that we were we we were laboring through at the time. Yeah, was people were saying like he hasn't been found guilty yet, and it's like he he admitted to enough. He said he admitted to enough. We had that argument. And then it kind 100 of times. and then it kind of flipped, and he pleaded guilty to yeah. actual crimes, and then you know long after that said, well, I didn't really do anything. Yeah, he's wrong. still there's basically <laughs> in, in my there's like three ways that you that they have that these statements are coming out one is that yeah i acknowledge it did something wrong uh, but you don't say what and then they often say like well there's you know there, there's there, you have to understand some context for it either the context was it was the olden days and this is just what we did with the ladies or on the opposite end of that spectrum i'm sick i'm a sick individual i'm an alcoholic or i'm un, i'm insane i gotta go get some help or there's like a middle ground where they acknowledge something happened, but it was consensual, or I don't recall things that way. I and remember they're not, the They're not outright saying, yeah. this person's lying, this is a fiction, it never happened. Something happened, but here's why it was maybe okay. Yeah, and it's so it's a way of like leaving things in doubt. You can have the both ways. You can say you, you get both the best. Try to get they're trying to get both things, which is the one being, I apologize. I acknowledge something. I should you should I should get my due for that. But also that's not true. Right. And I just wish there was like a, I wish they would just be clear about what they're acknowledging and what they're disputing because <laughs> this having it both ways thing just. Just doesn't sit I, right. I think what they what they mean to say, if they were left, if, to, if they were had the if lasso, like if, the, humans? if the lasso of truth were around them, yeah, is I did that, but it doesn't make me a bad person. Yeah, on account of I know myself and I'm a good person. <laughs> right, and so you need to acknowledge that whatever I've done, literally yeah. any any accusation against me, doesn't change how good I am. Yeah, and you should still like, and me. you should still like me. So, we have a very special show today. We are talking about a major story we released this week. It took us a long time to pull this thing together. And our reporter, Ashley McGlone, joins me to discuss and to highlight some, uh, some of the more moving and disturbing clips of audio we got from um, a bunch of people who graduated from La Jolla High School, several women who now say that they felt very uncomfortable and were subjected to unwanted touching by a physics teacher at La Jolla High School. And uh, over a long period of time, and we had several women on the record, and the reaction to this story has been incredible. And uh, we also have one of those women that came into the studio to talk about what her life has been like since this story came out, just not that long ago. And also just some of the behind the scenes thinking and, and what it took for us to get that story. Ashley does a, a wonderful job with that. And she had a great week. That was a great performance of journalism. That's, uh, I, you know, when you do sensitive stuff like that, as we do from time to time, it's, it, you know, you know what's at stake the night before you publish it. And I slept easy that night knowing how much work she'd done. And so we'll talk to her about all of that. Because, you know, the teacher may be gone. And the principal may be gone who dealt with it, but the, is the system gone? What is the system that let these women's complaints over a long period of time be ignored the way they were, right? Yeah. And that, I mean, and, that, and that's what we have, we've learned here is that this was, I'm, I'm growing weary of the term open secret very quickly in this last month that we've lived through, but this was very much an open secret in the La Jolla community, clearly. Absolutely, especially because we ourselves heard of it uh, years ago. And mm-hmm. so we've been pursuing this story for a really long time. And I think it's both because of Ashley's efforts and just because of this moment that we're living in that it finally all came together. But, um, you know, it's so, sort of similar to the Filner story where you hear all these whispers and there's just not enough to pull it all together until you know, this moment coalesces. Yeah. 
can we just clarify too this this feels like a like a revolution like there's there's so many powerful people being toppled being questioned that it this reckoning or whatever we're calling it is turning into a true force of social change i mean there's something you know if you think about um I've always said, for instance, that death is a very important part of like our economy, right? Because people die and their their companies fall apart and they get handed off and they then things change because people die. Well, it feels like there's like a thousands of very powerful men dying from public life because of this. And the resulting change that might come out of it seems profound. Or no. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like there's a purge going on right now. Uh, I think... I'm I'm less optimistic for you that than you are that we are going to be in a, a new and different place whenever it's all said and done. Unfortunately. I, I I'm not sure we will. I'm just saying literally the people in so many positions of power are losing those positions and there will have to be some change. I'm not even sure if it's good. There will yeah. be some change that comes out of it. I think what's interesting is that it seems like the most secure place for some of these people to be is in politics. Like it seems like if you're an elected congressman or running for senator or whatever with a vital vote in Congress, if you win, like you're more protected than than these guys that run businesses or something. Yeah. Well, yeah, and there's the fact that you know, president's still in office. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do. I do think that as a unintended consequence of all this, one thing that you could do if you wanted to not find yourself in this situation is if you're a political party, run a female candidate. And if you're a business, hire a female CEO. Mm -hmm. And maybe... Something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> that could deal with some of these structural issues. Huh. Yeah. you. All right. Our, um, we're going to talk about another powerful man in San Diego. Had a really interesting experience in court. Um, Mark Arabo, who's uh, the leader of the Neighborhood Market Association... Um, these guys have been uh, fighting for political power for years. They've thrown money around political campaigns. They've they've had various reprimands, and uh, we did a profile of, of. Yeah, I mean, I didn't include this in my story this week, although I realized after the fact I should have. Marco Rabo has wielded such political influence. He was in the same room as Barack Obama. Yeah, That's, he. he, he the, you know, this is not a. Uh, uh, a penny ante guy who's trying to warm in at the lowest levels. He was in the White House with President Barack Obama. We, in our profile, we talked about how he he took credit, at least in part, for for getting the president to bomb ISIS. Yeah. Right. Later learned that maybe the conversation didn't exactly go that way. <laughs> no, that's according true. to the other people in the room. But nonetheless, indisputable that he was he was in that room and. So, yeah, so basically this is a group of those corner store stores, right? The Neighborhood Market Association represents all those liquor stores in small places uh, all across San Diego yeah. that um, work together in some form that we didn't really quite understand as well as we do now that the trial has come out. But there was a group of those stores suing the Neighborhood Market Association and Mark uh, Rabo for their management. In particular, they accused him of basically taking money that he didn't deserve and the board of wrongfully approving those things. Yeah. So explain the case and uh, and this incredible ruling that the judge came out with. So, the, I mean, the, the, the argument was, as you say, essentially improper compensation, that he was receiving uh, pay and benefits that he wasn't entitled to. One specific one was a, a large sum of money received due to the sale of a uh, a property that the neighborhood market association owned whether it was a finder's fee or a commission for the sale or just a performance bonus for his role in the deal that was a central element of the law of the lawsuit another one was this uh personal expense report th account that he had which is very odd it was it, he had his salary and he had an expense account that was for nma related expenses and then he had a personal expense account that he could spend on anything he wanted it was just his money but he couldn't receive it as pay he had to get recouped the expenses um and they explained in court that this was a way to save the nma uh payroll taxes basically and to save him income taxes which the judge said 
that seems like a way to yeah, that's avoid a, taxes. Yeah, it's not okay. Which you can't do. Yeah, You're not supposed to do that. The IRS might be interested. So it's in like in in defending themselves from the allegation in the lawsuit that this was improper pay that he wasn't entitled to. They were like, no, 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 that's not true. This was about defrauding the IRS, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> which I, was a striking thing to hear. But <laughs> the big payout and the one that they were obviously most sensitive about the judge highlighting so much was this idea that uh, Mark Arbo received a, a payment for two hundred ten thousand dollars. Was it mm -hmm. from the Neighborhood Market Association that the board of directors? So he's at one point he was the like executive director of the association, and then he created his own company which which did a contract to manage the organization right yes yes and so there was this payment to him of about two hundred ten thousand dollars that was supposedly a performance bonus for his uh help in in um uh, getting the sale of their building the neighborhood market association building done mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the judge there was a lot of questions about the propriety of such a payment um it was a it was a building that ended up selling for 3.32 million dollars and so um aside from other commissions that must have had to go out this was just a payment for his ability in that and in order to justify this is just this is amazing to me so in order to justify the payment which uh, he's not a, a realtor no right no they're they're like why did you get deserve this right. money exactly and they produced a a letter from so this isn't quite right. Let me just okay, just yeah. uh, the the letter was give was used by the board okay. in their deliberations. They said when they greenlit this payment. Okay. So this is this was given by the broker to the board, which the board then used as their justification for giving him the money. So the the plaintiffs and the judge are like, why did you approve this? And they produced this letter. They said, right? well, here's the letter that we gave the board at the time. Right. Okay. So this is a letter from a commercial real estate broker right yeah uh what's his name uh mark uh mike habib and he says and he's describing mark's influence on this whole process he said quote i wanted to congratulate you and thank you again for your efforts in successfully negotiating and closing the sale of the nma building the transaction was complex and problematic, but the way you held it all together was brilliant. Brilliance in all caps with an exclamation mark. <laughs> exclamation. We started out with an offer from your tenant, Keller Williams, at $2.6 million. I remember what you told me they said they were going to offer. I remember what you told me they said they were going to offer $2.1 million, and you were right. And then you went back and forth with them tirelessly until the written offer finally came in at $2.6 million. It amazes me how you work them up from $2.6 million to $3.32 million. Amazing! Exclamation point. This is a totally natural letter that people write Normal to each other. thing to do. <laughs> I, it, to me, it came off as like the... The bill of health from like Trump's doctor to Trump. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm surprised your heart is so big. It's the biggest heart I've ever seen. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, th so this guy, he then kind of, so he sort of distanced himself from these claims in a deposition, but then reversed again and stood by the claims on the witness stand. And the judge, uh, in just, I just can't emphasize enough how remarkable the judge's ruling is. The judge said, I do not believe you about Mike Habib. He said, you came up here and you said that everything in that letter is true and you stand by it. And I don't believe you. He said, I don't know why you're telling a lie, but I don't believe you. Yeah. And that was the beginning of him eviscerating a number of people at the jury or at the trial who he said just lied on the witness stand, basically, he, or, or fictions, as he called them. You can still find this story at uh, voiceofsandiego.org. Great story about uh, the scaling ruling, and, and I think you're still uh, pulling back a little bit of this story. Yeah, I've got more to go. But, it, I mean, it, it, there's a, a, a great deal to still figure out how this is going to work. I mean, the judge said that the people running the Neighborhood Market Association now, which is Arabo through his company, can't be trusted to do it anymore. Quote, I do know this, the judge said, the organization should not be run by the people who are running it now in terms of administering it. Now, we... the it's not so easy. You don't just snap your fingers and, and 
you know, invalidate a contract. So I, I it's unclear exactly how this process is going to go, but that it's just a really big deal for anybody who's paid attention to what this organization has has meant for this industry in town and you know, they they've tried to be a very politically relevant organization. Yeah. I'm like such a legal nerd and I love a good scathing judge's ruling. And usually in the rare events that they happen, they're like about a concept or Mm -hmm. like an injustice that the judge is tearing apart. So to see it against like a bunch of individuals, you are a liar. (laughs) It was really amazing. It was, I, I was blown away, blown away by it. All right. Our hero of the week. Okay, this should go without saying, but the uh, the women who stepped forward, uh, having uh, gone through what they did in La Jolla High School, and were willing to talk now on the record, and have now um, de facto given permission to a bunch of other people to talk about their experiences. Uh, they are our heroes of the week, and um, also, I think the story and just their testimony provided tremendous relief to a lot and a lot of people, and so that's the purpose of what we do here. Our goat of the week. You lose. Good day, sir. The uh, Public Utilities Commission. And uh, n- another another bad bad look for them. This comes from KPBS. Quote: Court documents released this week indicate the California Public Utilities Commission used public money to try to block search warrants in an investigation into possible collusion with Southern California Edison over the closure of the premature. San Onofre nuclear generating station. Hmm. That is not something you should do. Yeah, don't do that. No, don't do that. not good. No. All right. Stay tuned for our discussion about a little behind, behind the scenes look of uh, this story and uh, the substance of the story that we put out this week. And our reporter, Ashton Glown, along with uh, one of the people that came out to speak, uh, Loxy Gann. This has been uh, our, the Voice of San Diego in partnership with News Radio 600 Global. Voice of San Diego podcasts are made possible in part by a generous supporter of Make-A-Wish San Diego. Just as Black Friday and Cyber Monday mark the beginning of the holiday shopping season, Giving Tuesday kicks off the giving season. It's a nationwide movement that celebrates giving back. Your gift to Make-A-Wish can help local children like three-year-old Riley. His wish was to have an accessible playground in his community park so kids of all abilities could play together. Riley's wish came true thanks to the generous support of people like you. Make-A-Wish needs your help to grant every eligible child's wish in San Diego this holiday season. On Tuesday, November 28th, join the Giving Tuesday movement by donating to Make-A-Wish. Visit www.sandiego.wish.org or call 858-707-9474. That's 858-707-9474 to help make a holiday wish come true. So this week we ran a, a special, very powerful story from Ashley McGlone, and we brought her into the Voice San Diego podcast studio to talk about it. Welcome, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Okay, so just give us the basics. What did you find out, and uh, how did you do it? So I was first made aware of some concerns about a physics teacher, a longtime physics teacher at La Jolla High School a couple of years ago. Um, at that time, a former student had reached out, Loxy Gant. Uh, she wasn't ready to go on the record, you know, come out publicly with her name and explain the harassment that she said she experienced in the classroom. So I put in a public records request with the school district. Uh, that was basically flat out denied initially. Um, a few months later, we learned this teacher was put on paid administrative leave for some reason while an investigation was done. I put in another records request, eventually got a handful of documents, but still no one coming on the record and, and sharing their experience of, of unwanted touching by this particular teacher over the years. Yeah, we had several conversations during that period wondering, you know, did we have enough to talk about? And, and we all just kind of decided like we needed something else, right? We needed to talk to other people. And we needed some kind of documentation from the district, something we could wrap our minds around with this. So it wasn't like you were working on this for two years, but it was like a slow effort to try to see if we could get that together, right? Absolutely, yes. And and when we when they did finally produce a handful of documents, 
they weren't the actual student complaints of the students that I had been speaking with. Mm -hmm. um, we did get, they did produce an anonymous student complaint that had been filed in 2016 using the online bullying form. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what spurred them to put him on paid administrative leave briefly. But when they couldn't identify who the student was, um, the email showed that they brought him back um, that the teacher now says that he was cleared. Um, the emails don't exactly say that. It's just they couldn't find the student and therefore they had to drop the investigation. It's weird to rest a, an anonymous complaint investigation on not being able to find the student. I mean, that's the point, right, of an anonymous complaint. Obviously, that person's fearful of something. And then to say, well, we can't do anything about it because we 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 can't know them. What's the point of an anonymous complaint line? Right, right. I think I mean, there's some practicality to it that I, I do understand. Sure. I mean, you you want to get more details. Um, I, I would hope and think that they maybe would have pulled a number of female students from the classroom. The, the student who um, did complain says that they were a female, that he gave her neck, rub, neck rubs, that she was intimidated by him. Uh, he gets upset if you tell him to stop. Uh, it's happened at least 10 times. So that's a, a semi-decent amount of detail. Um, yeah. yeah, how thoroughly they, you know, canvassed the classroom or pulled students aside to try to get more information, I don't know. Um, but but yeah, I, uh, Child Protective Services, I guess the current principal did reach out to and said they couldn't take a report without a name. The school police said, well, we don't have any witnesses and no name. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. So let's, we're talking about two sort of eras of time, right? We're talking about Loxie Gant, who came forward in 2003, at least came forward to the, to the school principal, the school staff and school principal, after an incident where uh, this teacher, this physics teacher, had grabbed her butt. And not just once or whatever, very clearly did it, um, what she said, two times. We're actually going to talk to Ms. Gant later in the show. She, we got her to come in and talk about how this has all affected her life since this story came out. But also, um, so let's just hear a clip from her and when you first talked to her about her experience after this incident and she took it to the principal's office, a man named Dana Shelburne. She sent me immediately down to the principal's office, wrote me a pass, and I went straight down and sat in Mr. Shelburne's office, principal at the time, and mm -hmm. told him the whole story. And he was very, I remember him being very defensive towards me about Mr. Teachworth. Like, I almost felt like I was, like, telling the story to, like, his best friend, you know, where it was, like, mm -hmm. where I was saying, I think this just happened, and he, he kind of kept pushing me to, like, say that it, it wasn't a big deal or that it didn't really happen or that. I just remember feeling, like, really, and I, cause I can't obviously remember the entire conversation, but I just remember feeling really, like, kind of not believed right away, you know? Okay, that was pretty powerful, and I think that's part of the theme of what of this whole story is people like Loxie go forward with something, and then nothing happens. And, and really the onus becomes not one on where they have to figure out if, if they need to do something about the teacher, but they have to figure out if the student's lying, right? It's like the framing right. is about why are you lying? Right. Or, or is it, uh, maybe it's not that harsh, maybe it's just like, you're saying something extremely serious, so serious we can't do anything about unless something else comes, which is kind of a debate we had, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a discussion we had to deal with as well. Right, right. It, does it go beyond a he said, she said, and what else can, what, what can you even do with the he said, she said? But I think that there's a big difference between, you know, asking probing questions, making sure you understand the report that's being made, and then trying to dissuade someone from reporting or making them feel immediately like they are not to be believed just because they're a student. Um, what I, what was explained to me kind of on, on multiple occasions with multiple students over the years was sort of this, like, are you sure this is what you're reporting? Are, are you really sure you really want to go down this path? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, if they didn't already have an obstacle enough, just having the strength to go down and report in the first place, they now have to encounter these adults that, that don't immediately believe them. That goes beyond just probing questions. Right. So, that was 2003 she experienced this, right? This mm -hmm. is Loxie Gant. She kind of lets it go for many years. And then 2013 or so, she starts to hear that some of this is still happening with this man's class and some of the students in his class. Mm -hmm. And we 
didn't we couldn't find a lot of these people at, around the 2015 but then some of them started coming forward after this whole me too movement began mm -hmm. after the harvey harvey weinstein scandal mm -hmm. uh, in hollywood now there's tons of people uh, being accused and other people saying you know something happened to them mm -hmm. now we had several women come forward including mara Cantor. she was in teachworth's physics class her junior year in 2011 and 2012 and uh, we have a clip from what she felt like she experienced and here's that it like to come up and surprise us by like squeezing our sides tickling um just awful and i hate getting tickled right. brushing my ear and my hair and you know coming up behind me and like touching me with the back of his body while he was grading something supposedly it's remarkably courageous of them to put their names to this right this was there we had four or five women that talked to us on the record right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um and and said yes i understand um I, i'm ready and i'm willing to come forward and let the world know what happened to me and i also have some questions about how it was handled and why it was handled the way that it was handled now did Cantor take their complaints somewhere? She did, yeah. She also um, had a meeting with Dana Shelburne, the principal at the time, with a couple of friends who were not in the story who didn't get back to me um, when I reached out to them. Um, said it wasn't a super long or meaningful meeting, uh, but that uh, she was told that they would look into it, and then she never heard anything ever again. I think what's... what's This is what I, I keep getting back to is... So, yeah, it's tickling, it's thighs, it's pulling hair, it's these weird noises it's uh you know brushing his, his back of his body against them yeah standing very close behind them sort of as they're standing at their lab desks and like leaning in over them and feeling kind of that presence above them behind them breathing on them so this must have been a, a maddening feeling because on the one hand like yes he's not necessarily groping in some of these instances obviously if he's you know grabbing somebody's butt that's something but mm -hmm. that sort of it, it would be maddening because you don't know if it's if it's how wrong it is you don't know if you're being if you're th thinking of something and so many of these stories come back to like okay finally i realize like stop you're you're doing something that other people don't do right you're you're too close you're making weird noises you're you're touching me right and i don't want that and that must have been a kind of a, yeah, yeah, it's not sexual assault necessarily, but it's also, it's also this thing that other people aren't doing to you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost doubly traumatic in the sense of like that mind game that's going on too. Like I can come right up to the edge mm -hmm. of assaulting you without actually doing that and and then you have to live with that every day right and so yeah so Mora in particular said that you know she recalls him leaning over her desk to sort of supposedly check her work and his arm grazing against her breast and that happens once and you think okay that's kind of strange maybe it was an accident he doesn't apologize or anything but maybe it's an you want to give the benefit of the doubt right um but then it keeps happening over and over and over again. And even male students that have, have reached out since the story ran have said, yes, he was much closer physically to the females than he ever was to the males. Um, but yeah, I, I personally can't think of a time, you know, he, a couple different girls said he would brush their hair back from their face. I can't think of one, any reason why a teacher would need to touch someone's hair um, or why they would think it's okay to brush their hair back from their face it, it, that alone the closeness of it all um the repetitive repetitiveness of it all yeah just created such i think such a hostile environment um an uncomfortable environment and a handful who did go and disclose and seek help didn't get it so let's talk about that what did what do we know about what the district knew so you did end up getting an exchange an email exchange where Loxie Gant had um, inquired about whether anything had been done. She'd been out of the school now a decade. And she's like, wait, this is still going on. What's going on? Have you dealt with it? What, what do we know about where complaints did come in and where they stopped? Right. So it's not incredibly clear where every single complaint landed. But what we do know is the school district says they have no record of 
Loxie's complaint or the investigation that followed or the investigator that she spoke to. But but the teacher, Martin Teacher, says he does recall all that and he does recall That's so crazy. So <laughs> that this he, did he happen. Used, yeah, he used that as his defense. He said, mm-hmm. I know of Miss Gant's complaint. Right. That was the district looked into that. Right. I was and cleared. It, and nothing happened. And I was cleared. Yeah, I disputed it. They dropped it. There was an investigation. And yet and yet we have Shelburne and the district saying we don't know that anything happened. Yeah, the school district says we've no record of her complaint. Um, and then we also did not get this 2013 email exchange from them where Loxie reached out to a teacher that was still there at the time, sort of saying, I hear there's still complaints coming in. How is this possible? The principal knows this guy is a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, how is he still in the classroom year after year? Uh, and what we see in this email chain is that teacher forwards it to the principal and a couple of vice principals. Dana Shelburne was on his way out. He was being transferred to a different job at the district. But just before he left, he writes back, um, I'm going to forward this to the person in HR that I've been working with for the last several months. This has been under investigation. So there's some indication that he was under investigation in 2013 for some reason. Um, and then and then the teacher forwards that to Loxie. And that's how she was able to see that and share it with us. There's also um, a policy you discuss that you discuss that we talk about with with Loxie in a minute uh, about w- how these complaints work. So what do we know about what's supposed to happen and what did happen with like a complaint like this? So what we know, the district has beefed up its policies in the last few years and made some changes um, at the urging of the California Department of Education, who came in and did an audit and said, hey, you need to make it clearer. One, um, what rights students have to be free from sexual harassment. Two, where they're even supposed to file such complaints, both students and parents, when these sorts of incidents occur. Um, And three, that there's a need for staff and employees to intervene and stop harassment if they see it happening, if at all possible. So they have made some changes. Um, It also looks like they've beefed up sort of their requirement um, or at least suggestion for school site administration to contact their Title IX coordinator at the district district to alert them when these incidents occur. But the policies that are in place even now and even on the school district website do sort of suggest and point to, hey, we believe that complaints about harassment, discrimination, intimidation can be handled at the school site. The district doesn't necessarily need to, you know, launch a full blown investigation every time is sort of the the direction it points. And then there's also the, the teachers union contract, which requires administrators to handle complaints against teachers at the lowest possible level. Um, again, what exactly that means isn't totally clear. Um, there, there is a requirement that the teachers be notified of these complaints in every instance, which this teacher claims didn't happen. Not totally clear. Um, the, the principal, Dana Shelburne, would not discuss how he handled specific complaints when he heard them, including the ones that uh, were shared with me. Uh, but he says, hey, I consistently followed the union contract and the district policies. And if that's true, then Teachworth, at minimum, Teachworth would have been notified. Uh, but yeah, we know, again, according to Teachworth and Loxie, you know, there was the 2003 investigation into her complaint. According to an email in 2013, there was some sort of investigation that HR was involved with that who knows what happened with that. Then in 2016, there was the anonymous complaint that was investigated. He was on paid administrative leave for a week and then brought back when they couldn't identify the student. And then there was also a different complaint, which the district says was filed by a a different teacher for an unrelated incident. They were removed from school. They complained to the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, claiming employment discrimination and said, you know, I'm being discriminated against. Teachers like Teachworth have complaints piling up and they're not taken out of the classroom. And so to some extent, his he was brought into that complaint as well. So that that's what we know and has been documented. But these other girls that have shared these stories have said, I, I too spoke with administration and apparently the district has no record of that. Now, Teachworth is not at the school anymore. He took part of, he was part of the uh, large group of teachers, senior teachers who took the buyout from uh, the district was struggling financially and chose to uh, pay teachers basically one year of salary if they agreed to retire right, right now. So he's, he's out. And, but our interest, of course, is about the whole system it's not just about Mm -hmm. his presence in the classroom but let's do uh, talk about him for a second you did finally get a hold of him Mm -hmm. through the investigation took some time Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the basic uh, themes of his response basically his initial reply was you know I absolutely deny any wrongdoing or misconduct with any student in my 38 years of 
of school teaching. Um, and then when I when he made it clear he would not be speaking to me on the phone or in person, I sent him specific accounts from these girls to run past him and say, okay, listen, these girls are coming forward on the record. This is what they say happened to them. This is what they say you did. And this is what they say you made them feel like. One, did this occur the way they described? Two, do you find it okay to touch your students this way if this indeed occurred? Um, and three, can you address any of this? Um, and he, that's when he said, okay, well, I remember Loxie's complaint, but I was cleared. I remember the 2016 anonymous complaint, but I was cleared. And I don't know about the rest of these, but I mean, I touch students on occasion, he says, you know, as I move about the classroom and the lab stations, but he described it as incidental, something that, you know, it's just sort of tapping the shoulder or moving them out of the way, not anything close to what these girls describe of, squeezing their th you know squeezing their hips and tickling and poking and breathing down their neck repeatedly grazing their chest he didn't address directly address any of that mm -hmm. he specifically denied the loxy gant one and then he had that general mm -hmm. denial of ever doing anything wrong right. he didn't actually address those other several complaints okay so there was another uh, woman you've talked to caitlin mccall and she expressed what she felt like really bothered her about the behavior not changing after she and others, I think, complained to the principal, right? Her friends complained and she gave them permission to share her experience on her behalf. Okay. But yeah, but she saw them going in and out of the principal's office and got their take of how it went down. All right. I have a, uh, we heard from her. So let's hear how she felt like this whole thing went. I feel like there's a, there's a really serious and pretty obvious, um, level of inaction and maybe corruption in San Diego Unified. Um, and it just, it isn't right. I mean, the, the job of the district is to take care of its students. That's its function, to educate and to care for the minors of the city. And I, I did not feel, not only did I not feel cared for, I felt unsafe in that classroom. Um, it wasn't just on discomfort. It was like a stone in my stomach every time I walked into the room. I felt unsafe um, and humiliated. And it was the district's job to look into that. It was the principal's job to look into that. And it didn't happen. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it wouldn't, it's gotten to the point where it wouldn't surprise me if this was going on, at, if there were similar situations at other schools. Mm -hmm. in the district because there's just nothing's done about it so okay wow mm -hmm. um this was a very powerful story we worked as hard as we could um, did all of our due diligence on it and published it on monday it's uh we're recording this on it's only tuesday mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been quite a couple of days yeah so what has the reaction been so far my phone has been ringing. My inbox has been flooded. Uh, many with student accounts who, you know, they aren't necessarily comfortable coming out on the record, um, but they, some are, um, and I'm following up with them because I want to get a better sense of how pervasive this was. I, I'm starting to see a picture that isn't pretty, um, but I, I want to get a better sense of it. I want to hear from as many students as possible um, and maybe do a follow-up report. Um, but yeah, there's there's quite a few students who've been impacted, quite a few that are surprised it took this long for it to come out, um, but also are, are thankful that it's finally come out. Um, some students have said, I didn't even totally realize what he was doing to me wasn't OK. But yeah, absolutely. He squeezed my hips. He mm -hmm. tickled my thighs. Oh, yeah, that is creepy. <laughs> you know, and there's students at the time. So I, I get that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of reflection going on. It is getting shared within the La Jolla community, especially and the graduates there. Uh, and and not a ton of surprise. Um, people have described it as sort of an open secret of sorts. Um, it, it's it's something again. I I did want to talk to the teacher. I, I'm you know still open to that if he wants to talk further more specifically. But but there is a not pretty picture coming forward of this being quite the pattern of behavior that made so many students very very uncomfortable, um, and really shouldn't have been tolerated for as long as it was. Well, Ashley McLone, great work. Thank you. Let's hear from Lexi Gant. We are actually joined in the Voice of San Diego podcast studio by Loxie Gant. Loxie, thanks for taking the time. Of course, my pleasure. Okay, so let's just start. The um, Why did you decide that you wanted to talk about this? 
Um, well, yeah, it had been 12 years since what happened to me happened. And uh, it turned out that in 2015, um, I found out that he had been made the archery coach mm -hmm. and was still teaching in school. And there were still more and more victims coming forward. And I just felt like something had to be done. And I've always followed Voice of San Diego for all the ballot measures and, and following you guys and your suggestions at um, at voting times. And so I just reached out and said, hey, I think I might have a story you guys might want to look into. And I'd appreciate your help in, in getting there. Is it something that you would describe haunted you over the years? Is it something that was there or is it just kind of like an annoying memory? How would you describe it? <laughs> um I wouldn't say haunted until more I became a mom in 2015 mm -hmm. and then it became very real. I think when you're 17 and you're a teenager and you're selfish and you're whatever, you just think, well, it wasn't that bad. It's fine. You know, it wasn't, you know, I think it only happened to me. It wasn't too bad. I'm sure the school took care of it and I didn't really think about it until I'm now living within that school system and I you know, we're faced with the idea of buying a house in that neighborhood and sending our child to that school mm -hmm. that I, all of a sudden it hit me really hard that there's a lot of parents that aren't aware and they're trusting the school district and the La Jolla high school system in order to protect their kids. And there's something wrong. There's just something missing here. Mm -hmm. And did you, when it happened, it feels like if something like that happened, it would it would cause like a jar in the in the space time of the, of the moment and there would be kind of this consciousness between you two that something weird had happened it, did he act weird at all was there any no I, my back was turned so i was facing the the whiteboard of the classroom uh -huh. and he there was like kind of a passageway between um where between a desk and the whiteboard his desk and the whiteboard and so he passed by me and then it sounds so weird to say grabbed my butt twice like and it's indisputably a little, yeah it was a double hit so it yeah. was kind of i think the mixture between like a squeeze and a pat you know where it was kind of like a cup yeah. it was so this sounds so strange no, to say but yeah it was it was an intentional because it was twice yeah and that's what really like if it was maybe like a once and a brushing by it wouldn't have startled me yeah um, but I felt, and I, so I went back to my chair and I sat down and he was just in passing and then went to do something else. So I never saw his face or anything while it happened. Then I just saw him walking away when I turned around. And did, were you aware at that moment of some of the, um, you know, feelings about his class or with, with other women? Never. I had never heard any sort of rumor or you shouldn't take his class or anything else. I, I had never heard even an inkling of it. So I was surprised when the investigator said to me, are you just doing this because of the other complaints? I just said, you know, what do you mean the other complaints? Yeah. You know, and that's what sort of then took me back and realized. And I think that and the reason I remember that moment so vividly sitting in that room with him was because I realized this was so much bigger than me. And I think my 17 year old brain kind of clicked into, oh, this could be important. Yeah. But I didn't understand at that time, like the scope of it. But that was when I understood that there was a lot more at stake here than just me getting transferred out of his class. Did you ever, you never heard anything back? I think one of the questions a lot of people had was, where, what were your parents' reaction? Yeah. And what, you know, you had to go, interview with this person alone it why did that happen like that do you think yeah so um my father's actually an attorney mm -hmm. and my mother actually works uh was working at that time for the school district getting her teaching credential um so we you know m they were very tapped in and i was 17 and looking back on it now i truly believe that my parents would never have known about the incident or the investigation if I didn't tell them myself. Um, I, w I told them what had happened and, and went to them um, about it after school that day. Um, and I told them, though, that I was talking with um, Dana Shelburne and who my parents knew pretty well. He also lived in the neighborhood, so my parents felt pretty confident that he would protect me. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, 
that, you know, I was going to talk to an investigator and I had to write a statement and draw a diagram and do all these things. My parents were like, okay, like they're handling it. It wasn't until 2013 when um, my mom heard rumors of this still happening that my mom came to me and said, like, Lox, this is still going on. What are we going to do? Hmm. And then in 2015, I think the archery team was, when it, it was written in the La Jolla Light in mm -hmm. 2015 that he was the archery coach. Mm -hmm. And if you think about archery, that's like, if someone's coaching archery, they're teaching, they're lifting your arms and doing, the, it just, I had just had my daughter and I got a pit in my stomach hmm. that there's, there's, a, there's a much bigger problem here than just me. Mm -hmm. You were not pleased with the outcome of the of the district that there was no reporting out. There was apparently no uh, actions. But what did it feel like to deal with the district and with the principal at that at that time? What, did it did it feel like they were trying to convince you that there was nothing here or that they were trying to put this away as fast as possible? Are we talking about in two thousand three or in two thousand thirteen? Both. Yeah. In two thousand three. 2002, 2003, I graduated in 2003. It was that school year. So in 2002, 2003, you know, I felt like I got, it was, I was very interrogated by, I felt very interrogated by um, Dana Shelburne in his office, but I watched a lot of cop shows and CSI and all of that stuff. And I felt like, okay, like this is how you're supposed to like make sure someone's telling the truth or, you know, I, I felt like, and I did always stand my ground with him um, in that, no, I'm not just doing this to get a better grade. You know, there was a statement made to me about, well, you can just transfer out. You don't have to like ruin his career to do it. And I'm like, no, like, that's not what I'm trying to do. I just think this is weird. And I don't know. And it, it sort of turned into, I felt like I had to toughen up in that room. Cause I was just scared before when I went to uh, my math teacher afterwards to report that it had happened. And then I'm sitting in this room and I felt like I was on trial myself that, no, I wouldn't just lie about this. Like, why would anyone just lie about this? Like, this is not something it, that's even in my repertoire to lie about, I guess. And so it just felt strange, that, especially as a 17-year-old. I'm like, you know, I've never complained. And I've never been sitting here in your office before. I've never been in trouble that I have to, like, come sit in the principal's office. So just even that's intimidating. Yeah. You know, the principal's office and sitting in that chair usually means you're in trouble. So I just felt you know, the, the stigma that went along with it, I just remember at the time feeling tense and just, and that's why I went home and told my parents. And, and I think my parents felt like, okay, great. Like Dana's handling it. This is all working out. You know, we lived a block and a half from each other. So mm -hmm. what's scary to me and what Ashley discovered and, and reported in her article. And I think the thing that took my breath away the most was not the girl's accounts, but what the district policy is, the district and union policy is. And that quote of situations being handled at the quote, lowest level possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonated with me huge because also at that time in 2003, that was when La Jolla High was working on their charter and there was a lot of other things being autonomous, I think it was called. And there was a lot of other things politically going on within the school that I think a scandal like this probably now looking back on it wouldn't have reflected well on the school. Um, so now looking back on it, I think that, you know, the lowest level possible I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and I feel like was the lowest level possible me going to the math teacher or was that me going to Shelburne or was that Shelburne calling in the investigator or was that the investigator deciding not to do anything about it? Like to what point? And then when um, Ashley and I did our records request in 2015 and there was nothing and I knew not only of mine in 2003, but then these other girls in 2013, my first thought was no, like this can't, be true that it just doesn't exist and that there's zero file and there's zero t to me it's almost like a like what you would keep for like a kid like a kid in a classroom right they like when they put out the report card it's like this happened and this happened needs to improve here da, 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 that there's some sort of record if administrations change how would if i didn't send that email in 2013 would the new administration have been informed of these past indiscretions against this teacher mm -hmm. if it's not written in the file how would they have known mm -hmm. it took me sending that email and it getting forward to them but then it was that same person that ended up giving them the the team so well, and out of everyone that I've spoken to, the one person that I would definitely expect the district to have 
some documentation of would be you because you went through all the hoops you jumped you know they said jump you jumped higher (laughs) like you did it all they brought in an investigator you sat there at length speaking to him you went home you wrote something up you drew diagram you did it all and then they still have nothing other girls I've spoken to said they went in talked directly to Shelburne he maybe did take notes he didn't take notes but like they were never another thing I noticed too that was troubling no one was ever given a complaint form okay you know other than maybe you writing your statement but no one else was handed okay he write down what happened we'll look into it further we'll have this process that's not what happened i don't know if there's a process yeah i guess that's what scares me and then if you think about it that lowest level possible isn't just the rule for high schools that's elementary schools too Mm -hmm. that's district wide that doesn't mean just teenagers making complaints that could be a six-year-old making a complaint what really struck me out of the articles or out of the article was just the common recurrence of people of girls being afraid to go back to the class being uncomfortable, dreading it. I mean, physics is already hard. <laughs> like <laughs> really if you, hard. Yeah. If you happen to also have a fear that your your teacher is going to touch you or look at you or hiss at you or do any of the weirder things that he, that we, we were described, that may not be sexual assault or whatever, but that's still it's still a traumatic thing that if you think back on the decades of service could have affected hundreds of people and thousands and yeah and what could it have meant for what careers they pursued or what interests they pursued i mean that's part of the hard part let me ask you this what what response have you gotten since the the story ran you were on the the picture you obviously um you know you posted it uh, you must have heard back from some folks i did i think um this is on my facebook so i guess that makes it public but you know and i and i did share it publicly and let people comment on it publicly um which is public record now i guess because you can use that stuff but um a lot of people said um back um, a couple months ago i had written a me too statement like Mm -hmm. everyone else did but i wrote underneath it specifically the people i felt in my life that had made me that victim and i wrote a high school teacher and when this article came out a couple people from high school ended up commenting on this article. You know what? When you wrote me to a high school teacher by a high school teacher, I immediately knew who that teacher was. Mm -hmm. I immediately knew who you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't close with them that they would have known what happened to me, but I, you know, they all knew, um, down to some of my really close friends in high school, remembering me telling them about this, you know, my, the, the guy I was dating at the time, remembering that this happened, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I guess in my head, I never really thought that they would remember. And I never thought of using them, I guess, as proof to you as, you know, and we ended up, I ended up finally going through the yearbook and remembering the kid that was sitting next to me that I returned wide-eyed to, and he remembered it. But I, you know, it was hard for me to think that remembering the story would have impacted other people so much so that they would still remember it this much mm-hmm. longer out. Um, but... I don't know. I, <laughs> I'll i say that that a handful of students who've reached out to me since the story published just said, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe what it took for those like Loxie to come forward. I I wanted to report, but I was too afraid. I, they, they really went the lengths of telling the right people and then still nothing happened. One, how depressing is that? But two, they just had a lot of respect and admiration for those of you who did go through all that um, and come forward again, as students, um, looking for help, looking for, you know, someone to address it. Um, so kudos to you guys who, who went Thank through you. all that and Thank didn't just you. sit silently, but although that would be totally reasonable as a student. And they did. And, and yeah. one of the things that didn't affect me at all. And one of the things I, I told Ashley when we were working on this was, um, Mr. Teachworth at that time was the only advanced and AP physics teacher. And so a lot of the other girls that this happened to in 2013, um, that came forward, they had already been accepted to very prestigious schools, to Barnard, to Northwestern, to these very prestigious schools. And part of that application process is that once you're admitted, you're not allowed to change your academic register for the rest of the year. Let's pretend for just a second that the that the superintendent of schools, Cindy Martin, was sitting right here and the leader of the teachers union was sitting right here. What would you ask them or what would you tell them? I would ask them one have they been following all of these stories? Are they aware? Have they read articles and have they, um, have they just heard about it? I guess. Mm -hmm. Has anyone even come to you? Has this even ever reached you? You know, (laughs) or are these, when these articles happen, are they printed out and put on your desk in the morning or are you 
kind of sheltered from these kind of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I want to know how aware they actually are. So in terms of the union and where their priorities lie, where does student safety fall on your list of priorities? And do your rules demonstrate that? And do your actions demonstrate that? And like, can you show me something that you've done to protect student safety yeah. against quote unquote bad teachers, you know, and I don't want to call, you know, there are just, just like how cops now have cameras on their chests. Why aren't there cameras in classrooms? Why aren't there, why isn't there some sort of checks and balances? Imagine worst case scenario, there was a school shooting, but if you had every classroom on camera, you could find the gunman and know if there's one or two or how many in, in an instant. Hmm. I think student safety has been greatly overlooked for so long and I could start a GoFundMe right now and put cameras in every elementary classroom that there was. I think it would prevent theft and for teacher safety as well, for bullying, for cheating, for, you know, I think it would, I don't know what the problem is. And the teachers union has been pretty vocal against these cameras and I want to know why. Mm. So I, I just have, a, I have a lot of questions. I could sit down for hours if they want to, <laughs> we'll but. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, Lox again, thank you so much for thank taking you. the time to come in, but also for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you guys for reporting and, and for being, for defending everyone in San Diego and having our backs when we, when we feel like nobody else does. My pleasure. Yeah, our pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. The Voice of San Diego podcast is part of the Voice of San Diego podcast network. Visit voiceofsandiego.org slash podcast to learn more about the Cura Chaos show about movers and shakers on both sides of the border, Beer Talk Radio, our business shows Startup Vault and I Made It in San Diego, and the rest of the shows in the network. If you like the show, go to voiceofsandiego.org and click the donate button. Or if you'd like to sponsor it, contact me at kinsey at vosd.org. That's K-I-N-S-E-E at vosd.org.